We've been covering the HIV issue for some time now, and, well, nothing surprises me from the HIV industry, the HIV mafia. But um, at the end of the day, what's going on right now with Lindsay Nagel and her baby Rico is absolutely atrocious. Uh, it's beyond words. It's one of the most sick, evil stories that I have seen in a long while. And believe me, folks, I've seen it all, especially in regards to the HIV issue. Um, joining us now is Steve Nagel. He's the grandfather of baby Rico and Lindsay's dad. And he's been dealing with this on a personal level for many, many years now, starting with Lindsay's adoption from Romania in 1990. Uh, Steve, thanks again for coming on. I know this is very tough to talk about and it must be very tiresome to continue to reiterate on all these different shows that you've been doing. But at the very least, it's encouraging to see some of the media is getting the word out on this story. Um, let's start with Lindsay's adoption kind of as a prerequisite here to set up uh, the current situation of, of your grandson. Um, you adopted her in 1990. She was tested in Romania. She was fine. And then she came here and was tested again. What happened then? Well, thanks for having me on, Bob. Uh, we adopted Lindsay. She got back here. She had actually tested negative in Romania. Uh, once they, when, we do, when they do international adoptions, uh, they just run a battery of tests on these children. And they did the same with Lindsay, and the, and the test came back uh, positive, that she was positive for HIV. So at that time, uh, we were passed off to an expert or a, a infectious disease doctor at Children's Hospital. And uh, that doctor, at, at that time, the drug AZT was was not had not been tested on children, so uh, she was the only doctor in Minnesota that was able to uh, treat, or she she oversaw the protocol to treat children with HIV on the drug AZT. Uh, so Lindsay was immediately started on AZT, and uh, you know we when we got the prescription we ran down to the pharmacy and actually sat on the uh, on the floor of the pharmacy to give her her first dose because we wanted to you know give her as much of a life as as we could uh, at that time the doctor said she had probably about a 20 percent chance that she would make it to age two uh, and we would also spend most of the time in the hospital she you know she said we'd probably have six good months, then after that it, w it would be downhill and 20% by two years of age. So we put Lindsay on the drug. Uh, Lindsay was completely healthy when we got her back here to the United States. Uh, so we put a healthy kid on the treatment. Uh, the, she had a lot of problems eating. She didn't, uh, she didn't want to take the bottle. She did, she, as she got older, she didn't want to eat. She was really tough to handle at the table. And her growth chart, uh, which she had, you know, we had been tracking, the doctors had been tracking on a growth chart, uh, her growth started to level out. And uh, it, it separated away from the, you know, from normal and started to flatten out uh, both on weight and on height. And um, Lindsay, as time progressed, Lindsay started losing a lot of her muscle tone uh, she would wake up nights screaming and holding her, her knees and her legs. Um, and we just saw a, a continual decline in Lindsay's health, which the doctors were at that time were saying, well, this is the result of the HIV and, and she's progressing into AIDS. Well, we didn't, uh, you know, we weren't, we had a lot of questions about the treatment at that time, and uh, my father-in-law saw an article in the National Review on uh, Peter Duisberg, who uh, was doing a lot of research on HIV, AIDS, and the treatments. So we wrote to Peter Duisberg and asked him, you know, what what his thoughts were on, you know, on this treatment. Well, he, met, he sent us a letter back right away, and he said, you must take the child off from the 
AZT immediately or she will die like Kimberly Brigalis. And Kimberly Brigalis was, uh, her and Ryan White were the two people that were probably followed the most. They were young and both of them, you know, according to the media, had died from AIDS. Uh, when you really look back and see what, you know, how they, how those two specific people died, it really didn't have anything to do with AIDS. It was uh, Kimberly Brigalis uh, on her last TV interview was clearly, uh, to me anyway, was was poisoned. She was she was laying on a couch and she was drooling out of the side of her mouth. Well, that doesn't look like a. a anything that I've seen as, as far as a, a virus that would cause that type of reaction. But anyway, we took Lindsay off from the drugs immediately. Um, and right away, within a few weeks, she started, uh, well, right away, her leg cramps went away. And within a few weeks, she started to gain weight. And I, I don't remember how many weeks it was, but in a short period of time, she had recovered 23% of of her total body weight uh, and she was eating good at the table and, and she was just kind of a different kid. She wasn't wound up all the time and, and agitated. And at the time when we did that, the doctors uh, threatened us at that time that, you know, there were uh, foster homes for children whose parents didn't uh, prescribe to the medication and didn't follow doctor's orders. Uh, luckily, the media stepped in and kind of kind of backed them off, so we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't have the problem that we have today. Uh, at that time, there were 12 children uh, that, that fit the same category as Lindsay. Lindsay was one of the 12. There was a total of 12 children in Minnesota that supposedly had AIDS, and they were all seen by the same doctor because of this protocol on the AZT. Uh, the longest any of the other 11 lived was to be six years of age. Lindsay will be 23 in October, uh, and she just had a baby December 19th, and that's kind of where we're at today. So, yeah. so she's in good health today. Um, you haven't seen uh, any real health issues. In fact, you told me in, in past talks that we've had she was pretty much healthier than a lot of the other kids in her class over the years. Um, and, uh, well, she, she had a baby recently, a uh, healthy pregnancy, right? Yes, it was full-term baby. Uh, baby was perfectly healthy. Uh, they did a lot of blood work on him right when he came, when he was born. Uh, they knew from Lindsay's previous record, they were, they were, we, we kind of got ambushed at the hospital, so they demanded that the baby be tested immediately. Uh, and, in, and in doing all of this testing, they had done all of the T cells and all of the, all of the typical HIV testing that they would do on the blood work, and everything on this baby on December 19th was completely normal. What happened next? Well, about 15 minutes after the baby was delivered, we had uh, infectious disease, disease doctors walk in. We had the Mayo Clinic lawyer walk in. We had social workers come in, and they demanded that the baby and Lindsay be tested for HIV, or they would have the child put in protective custody, and Lindsay would be listed as... Um, now the word escape, escapes me on that, uh, as child endangerment. Child neglect, yeah. Right. Uh, Lindsay refused at the time, and we knew that they had already started proceeding. We don't live in the same county as Moore County, but they had already started on the, the paperwork in the county that we live in. They had, uh, against HIPAA rules, they had sent all of Lindsay's information over to the county, the baby's information over to the county, and then started threatening us. So with all that at hand, uh, we discussed it, and I, I told Lindsay, you know, they're going to end up giving this drug to the baby and testing the baby because they're going to get a court order to do that, and you, then you will you will have 
you know, this on your record that you were, you know, charged with child endangerment. So I called the lawyer back up in Mayo and I said, you know, we'll go ahead with the testing, but I need you to give me your word that you will, you know, that this situation with Moore County, which is a different county than, than Mayo Clinic is in, that, that all of that stops and goes away. And the lawyer gave me his word that he did. Um, so the baby was, baby and Lindsay were both in the hospital for about a week, and then the baby continued on in the hospital because he had gotten a little a little pneumo between his lung and his chest wall so it's like a little pocket of air and uh so he was his lungs couldn't expand to the degree that they needed to so he was on oxygen for about three or four days right and in that amount of time he had it's very essential that when the baby pops out that they start feeding right away. Sure. Well, he didn't. He didn't have that ability because he had a tube put down his throat for oxygen. Uh, so he was he was a little bit awkward with handling breastfeeding, and he he didn't bottle feed well at all. So it took a <coughs> excuse me. It took a few um, a day, few days uh, while he was in ICU. Lindsay would work on and off with him. And then they would supplement through a nose feed, uh, giving the baby the milk that so that he was getting the amount that he needed between between breastfeeding and the nose tube. Yeah, just so I'm clear, Steve, were they forcing the medication at this point already? Yes. Okay, so he, he was put on medication the first day. The first day he's born, they're they're dosing him up with. Is it still AZT? From what I understand, they they don't use AZT. It's uh, other retroviral drugs. No, it's it's still AZT, and then now they've add there's two wow. other uh, drugs that they add with it because it's uh, uh, is Truvada one of them? No, that's not one of them. That, okay. That, you know, I can't think of what the two other ones are. And I've I've been out. I've tried to stay out of the HIV thing for years, and now I'm tossed back into it. Well, you have to. Uh, AZT for those of our listeners that don't know, we talked about the side effects that Lindsay suffered. It's a reject chemotherapy drug, a DNA destroyer, if I understand it correctly. Is that right? Yes. Okay, yes, so it, it just goes in and indiscriminately kills cells. The doctors it, won't say that, but that's what it does. Exactly. All right, so go ahead. Yeah, he's having a hard time feeding. Uh, Lindsay finally works with him, and he starts breastfeeding, right? Right. We've got him going. Uh, then there's a, another room that, that Lindsay and Cheryl, my wife, got moved into, it's like a little tiny hotel room so that you're close to the IC, but ICU, but that the mother and the baby can start uh, the breastfeeding and doing that as a complete feed so that, that you get away from the nose tube and the baby's able to go home at, after you've completed that. So that was about a five-day process. During that time, uh, we had bought some special uh, bottles that were made for infants that have problems feeding, and uh, we got him going on those. And between the breast and these bottles, he was he was doing fine. He wasn't taking any supplemental uh, feeding through a nose tube at all. So after five days of that, uh, we finally, Lindsay got to bring the baby home. And we were home for about five days. Lindsay had made, during the time that, she had been in there, one of the doctors there said, well, maybe you'd like to see a nutritional doctor. Uh, so Lindsay did set up an appointment to see this nutritional doctor. Um, we didn't, Lindsay had gone up to the cities on a Wednesday, and on a Thursday, the Moore County stepped back in, the county that had the uh, you know, that the, the Mayo Clinic lawyer had initially talked to, and they called and demanded to see Lindsay give the baby the drugs, and she only had a half hour to produce the baby. Well, Lindsay and my wife and Lindsay's fiancé were north of the Twin Cities at that time, so I called the, the CPS uh, CPS person and I said well they can't do that I said they're they're north of the Twin Cities 
we can't possibly make that time arrangement. So I set up a time with him for the following day, uh, which was 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. And he said that was fine. He said, you know, they were they were upset that they couldn't come see the baby. We didn't even know we were being watched. So at 3 o'clock on the Friday afternoon, he pulls up, but he comes with the sheriff. And the sheriff walks in the door, and we're expecting to just show them us feeding the baby the drugs. Instead, they don't want to see any of that. They have... There's a five-page document of which they only presented the back two pages of. We've still not seen the top three pages of that to this day. <clears throat> they came in, took the baby away from the only food source that that baby had, and took off with him. They found out they didn't have any way to feed the baby, so they immediately had to take the baby back to Rochester, to the Mayo Clinic, and check him back in where they put a nose tube back down the baby because Mayo Clinic had no way to feed the baby because he was 90% of his food came from the breast. So that brings us up to about, I don't know, probably two or three weeks ago. Uh, they put the child in protective custody. So for 72 hours, we didn't even know he was back in the hospital. We had no idea where he was, who had him. Uh, the county wouldn't talk to us. Sheriff wouldn't talk to us. We didn't know he was back in, in Mayo Clinic. So after 72 hours, uh, then we have a hearing. We find out that uh, Rico is back in the hospital. The mother and father, Lindsay and John, are the only ones that are able to go see him. Well, during the 72 hours, this kid had had numerous MRIs, he had had numerous x-rays. He had had swallow tests. So all of this stuff had been okayed by the county because now the, now the child is in the county's custody. So they just blindly signed off on all of this stuff. Uh, within the first few days, he was already maxed out on radiation from all of the x-rays. They still were giving him x-rays yesterday because now they say, well, the, you know, the, the, the benefit outweighs the risk. I, I don't know how they determine that, but um, they didn't like the situation with the nose, with with feeding through the nose, because he would pull the the tube out, just waving his arms around, and every time the tube has to go back in, it has to be X-rayed, so they make sure that the tube ends up in the stomach where it needs to be. So the kid has had a ton of radiation off from all of these x-rays. Then they decided to put a G-tube in, which is a, a tube that goes into the side of the stomach so that they can feed him his drugs and his food through his stomach. The kid hasn't had anything go down his throat now for probably almost two months. He just sucks on a pacifier, that's all he does. The first G-tube that they put in, they put it in incorrectly, and it leaked on both sides. Well, the, on the inside, all of this food or whatever, drugs, everything that was being put in, the leak went, got in between the stomach wall and the outside wall of the, of the body, and to this day is still uh, probably floating in there because he's got a, a bloated stomach now that looks like a little African baby which I was told two weeks ago that that bloated stomach came from him sucking so hard on his pacifier that his stomach filled up with air. Well, this, this stomach is so tight. I was over and saw him today. His stomach is, still feels like a little basketball. It's just that rigid, and it's, it's swollen up. It's, it's on this little tiny uh, eight-pound baby. It's about three inches bigger or stands three inches farther off from his body than it should. I mean, it's just a grotesque deal. So now you've got Mayo Clinic saying, well, this is because he's sucking so hard on his pacifier, which I can't find anything else in life to relate that uh, thought to. Uh, they've backed off from that now because the media has come in, and I've told this story so many times that uh, they're starting to feel foolish about this themselves. But <clears throat> anyway, that's... Uh, all of 
all of this stuff, all of the traumatic stuff, the cutting and all of the drugs, the the uh, morphine and all of the stuff that has been used on that baby since he was taken out of this house was due to the county taking the baby out of this house because they had no way of feeding him. So that baby has been chopped up. He's now yesterday got his fourth blood transfusion, and that's a direct result from the ARV, the antiretroviral treatment. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know if, if he's going to make it. I, it it's, a very, uh, it's a very grim situation right now. Uh, I was over with him today. Uh, he's he's in, in, very, in a very fragile situation right now, a very fragile condition. That being said, um, I, I think that's the gist of the story here. Uh, I don't want to dwell too much on the gory details. It's just... I mean, this is disgusting, folks. Absolutely pitiful. Um, what can people do to help? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, we could sit here and, and be depressed, which I am, and, and angry and upset, but we need to channel that and, and try to help and, and try to save Rico, as, as the website suggests, uh, saverico.com. Steve, uh, what are you asking for people to do to try to help? Uh, right now, the best thing that people can do, we live in a, in a rural, rural area. Uh, Moore County is, is very rural here. There's not a lot of people that live here. Uh, the county seat, which is Austin, and that's, that's where uh, all the judges and everybody around here lives and works out of. If you go to saverico.com, there's a tab on there that you can click that says, what can I do? If you click on that tab, it will drop down, I think it's probably about six or seven names. And, and these are politicians, these are elected officials here in this county that you can contact uh, with either an email or a letter. Uh, I don't know if phone, phone numbers are in there, but it, it's very intimidating to these people that other people are actually able to see what's going on here. This has never happened in this county before. Uh, we had to fight to get uh, to get the on on April 1st and 2nd we have our final trial to see whether the county continues custody of this child or whether the county gets backed out of here. Um, so if you know if people can just send off a quick email that would help us out a lot and let no, let people know uh, or let these politicians know that people are watching. And uh, the media has had some pressure on them to cover it. Uh, you have a new story coming out uh, tomorrow night, which I look forward to seeing. Hopefully they'll get the word out. I personally have called Steve. Uh, I did not get a call back from Child Protection Services. And isn't it ironic they go by child protection services? In this case, it's more like child torture services. Um, absolutely sick. So, folks, again, saverico.com. What can I do? I see t uh, the Mauer County commissioners are on there. Uh, you have your state senator on there. I, I don't see the, the judges on there, um, but uh, I'm sure you can look those up. Uh, there's State Representative Gene Pope. I mean, Folks, call, pick up the phone, send letters, you know, emails. Uh, I guess nobody snail mails anymore, but the bottom line is do something about this. Uh, if you're in the area, show up uh, at the, the Mauer County Courthouse April 1st and 2nd. Uh, that's when your next hearing is scheduled in, geez, uh, about a month. Uh, what do you hope takes place at that hearing, Steve? Well, obviously, I hope that they, uh, you know, that they they cut the county out and say that, you know, this is, you know, this is an unjust case. The problem with that theory is that we're going to be presenting the same information to the same judge. Uh, I don't know that I am going to expect a different result unless the public gets out and demands that, that something different be done here because it's, uh, uh, it doesn't look to me like they're going to, you know, just close the book on this and walk away unless they get exposed for what they're doing. And 
Uh, we fought to get the trial open. Uh, they didn't want to open the trial, but they couldn't come up with a reason not to open it. So it is an open trial. Uh, it should be a very interesting trial. I, I can guarantee you when I get on the stand, it'll be very interesting. And uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I, you know, I, I hope they uh, can find some conscience here and and uh, you know actually put this family back together because that's what they proclaim that they do. So I guess we'll see what happens on April 1st. We wish you all the best, Steve. Uh, please stay in touch and keep us up to date with what's going on in this case. Save Rico, folks. Save him. Do what you can. Uh, we need to get this baby back in the arms of his family while it's still possible. Um, Steve Nagel has been our guest. Again, uh, his grandson Rico is uh, has been kidnapped, tortured, and poisoned, and we really need to get the word out on this story. So please, if if you're moved by it like I am, do what you can to help. I can't say that enough. Uh, thanks again, Steve. Uh, all our thoughts are with you and all our prayers and love and, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much for having me on, Bob.